Hey, this is Kip, and in this video, we're going to look at the upcoming G1000 NXI version 1.0. This is a huge milestone for the working title team and for Microsoft because this makes the NXI the new default G1000 in Microsoft Flight Simulator. This update will be available when Sim Update 10 comes out at the end of August, but if you want it right now, you can actually opt in for the public Sim Update 10 beta for both PC and Xbox and start using it right away. To do so, all you have to do is download the Xbox Insider app on your Xbox or PC, opt in to the Microsoft Flight Simulator beta, restart your system, and then let the Sim update itself, and then you'll be on the beta. For more detailed instructions, check out the link in the description below. All right, now let's get into the new features in 1.0. The first one, and the one I'm most excited about, is that the Microsoft Flight Sim ATC now synchronizes with the NXI flight plan. So what that means is you no longer have to use the world map to program in your IFR flight plan if you want IFR clearance. You can now do it manually in the NXI, and as long as you have an origin and a destination airport entered, it'll reveal the option for you to request that IFR clearance with ATC. So here I happen to be at a towered airport, so I've tuned into the clearance delivery frequency. As soon as I put in my destination, you can see it reveals this option, request IFR clearance for instrument flight plan. If you don't have a clearance delivery frequency at the towered airport that you're at, you can use the ground controller to do the same thing. If you're departing from an untowered airport, what you need to do is first get airborne, and then you can use the ATC window to contact the nearest center controller. In this case, for me, it was Denver Center. So when I click on that, you'll see the only option is to request flight following. But if you go through that process, then it will reveal the request IFR clearance option. Hopefully that gets fixed or changed in the future, so you can do that in your first contact with them. But for now, that's how you have to do it. In the case that you change your flight plan or change your destination, you can once again click that same request IFR clearance option, and then ATC will be made aware of your destination or your route change. Next, let's talk about two new features, the weather radar and radio altimeter. Now these two are special features because they only will work if the plane you happen to be flying has this equipment actually installed on it. So some planes that have it are the Grand Caravan, the Diamond DA-62, the Beechcraft Baron, and the Beechcraft Bonanza, and third-party planes like the Kodiak 100 by SimWorks Studios. So if you happen to be flying a plane that has its own onboard weather radar, you'll have access to a new screen on the NXI. Now this is separate from Nexrad. We've had Nexrad for a while now, and you can access it using the soft keys on the bottom of the MFD. To access the weather radar screen, you just turn the inner FMS knob to go to that page. So you can see here under traffic map, there's a new page called weather radar. Once you're here, you'll notice that it's off by default. So to turn it on, all you have to do is use the soft keys at the bottom. So click on mode, then standby, and then weather, and it will be activated. The first thing I'm going to do is hit the back soft key at the bottom and then click on this little bearing option. This draws a teal line that makes it easy to tell if the weather in front of you is to the left or to the right of your current bearing. So this will make it easy to turn to dodge any precipitation that we want to avoid. The default range goes out to 10 nautical miles from our current position, but you can use the range knob on the right, just like you would on any other map screen, to change that. So here I've raised it up to 40 nautical miles. And from the looks of things, we have a ton of weather in front of us. Now remember, Nexrad and our onboard weather radar, they don't detect clouds, they detect precipitation. So this means there's rain or snow or sleet here. If I click the vertical button at the bottom, we get a different view, and this will show us how high or low we are in relation to that weather. The button in the bottom right changes from a bearing button to a tilt button, but it has a similar purpose. It draws an extended line here in teal or cyan, and it represents our current altitude. So it just makes it a little bit easier to tell if we are clear of that precipitation or not. Just like when we're in horizontal mode, we can use the range knob on the right to zoom in or out to get a better understanding of how high or how low we are. But in this mode, it actually changes both the range and the altitude numbers as we zoom in or out. So you can see now we're at plus or minus 15,000 feet instead of plus or minus 60,000. When it's plus or minus 15, each one of these dots represents around 3,000 feet. So we can see that we're about 6,000 feet above this weather in front of us right here. 
Something you might want to do if you leave the weather radar screen on is to make sure that you have the inset or HSI map turned on over here on your PFD. So if you click on map at the bottom and then click on layout, you can choose between having the map off or the inset map, which is in the corner like this, or the HSI map, which combines your HSI with the map itself right here in the middle. And then you can use the range knob on the PFD to zoom that map in and out. So when you're zoomed out and you're seeing a whole look at your cockpit, you can have both the weather radar on over on your MFD and then still have a small map available on the PFD to look at. If you're flying a plane that has a radio altimeter, what this does is give you your current height above the ground, your above ground level or AGL altitude. And when this is under 2,500 feet, you'll see the reading right here on the PFD. If you're flying an instrument approach and looking up your minimums, so for the approach I'm flying, the minimums are 5585 MSL, or to the right of that, the smaller number, that is 250 feet AGL. So because our radio altimeter gives us an AGL reading, we can actually use the RA setting when setting our minimums. So here, instead of Barrow, I'm choosing RA. And instead of entering MSL, I'll enter the AGL value from the approach plate, 250 feet. You can also set your minimums over on the PFD by going to the timer references menu. And you can see we also have the option for RA down here. So then when we're on final, we can look at our RA number. Right now it's about 740 feet AGL. Compare that to our RA minimums right there in teal of 250 and know when we reach our decision altitude. Next up, let's look at VNAV altitudes. Up until now, you were only able to edit an altitude in your flight plan if it was part of a procedure. But now, with the 1.0 update, you can edit every altitude in your flight plan, including the destination airport. So to edit an altitude, we just need to turn on the FMS cursor by pushing the inner FMS knob. Use the outer knob to select an altitude. And then once you have the altitude that you want to designate for VNAV highlighted, use the inner knob to enter edit mode. In this mode, you'll be able to select each of the digits of the altitude individually. You do that with the outer knob and then use the inner knob to change that digit. So I'm going to change this to 8,000 feet because when I get to that waypoint, WAPHAP, I want to be at 8,000 feet. So as soon as I'm done, I hit enter and you can see it turn blue and it has a little pencil icon next to it to let us know that we've manually edited that altitude ourselves. You can see that the top of descent has already been calculated and it's in about 27 minutes. So to enable VNAV on the autopilot, all you have to do is lower our selected altitude. So I'll bring that down to 8,000 feet. And then just press the VNAV button to arm V path mode. So that's on standby and it'll automatically start our descent for us as soon as we hit that top of descent marker. As I mentioned, we can also set a VNAV altitude for our destination waypoint. So here, KCPR is my destination airport. You can see it's at 8,000 feet just because that's the last VNAV altitude we put in. But what if I want to set this lower to, say, the traffic pattern altitude at that airport? First, I'm going to highlight KCPR and then press Enter. That'll bring us over to the Waypoint Information page. Up here in the top right, you can see the airport elevation, 5,330 feet. So all I have to do is go back to my flight plan and set our traffic pattern altitude based off that. So if we're doing 1,000 feet above the airport elevation, we would just enter 6,330 feet. Then I can just enable VNAV so it'll start the descent to get us down to that traffic pattern altitude by the time we reach the airport. For now, once you get close to the airport, you're probably going to want to switch to heading mode on your autopilot and then use that to fly parallel to the runway while VNAV is still descending you down to the traffic pattern altitude. In the future, we may see the addition of a feature called track offset that would actually let us define how far parallel to that track that we would fly. So it would actually fly a specific number of miles away from the runway and still be in alignment with it. We'll look out to see if that happens in the future, but for now you can use the heading bug and your heading knob to just visually fly parallel to that runway. Another new feature is the ability to use the autopilot to fly a localizer back course approach. If you've ever flown an ILS or a localizer only approach, you're familiar with tuning into the localizer frequency and using that to get horizontal guidance for the runway you're landing on. A localizer back course approach may be available to allow you to land on the opposite side of that runway using the same localizer antenna. 
So your autopilot needs to be told that it's a back course approach so it knows how to correctly interpret the signals coming from that localizer antenna. One example of a back course approach is at Whitman Regional in Oshkosh. They have a ILS approach available for runway 36, but on the opposite side of that, there's a back course approach available for runway 18. Remember that with a back course approach, just like a localizer only approach, you only get lateral guidance to line you up with the runway and you're responsible for the descent. When you're on the approach with autopilot, make sure to press the BC button so it knows that you're approaching from the back side of the localizer. Otherwise, it'll turn you around 180 degrees, assuming that you're approaching from the front side. Last but not least, we're going to look at an improvement that is not on the NXI itself, but it was done by the working title team, and those are improvements to the VFR map. You can use the new search box at the top or click on any waypoint to get detailed information about it. So in this case, I've clicked on this airport. You can see the runway information and the elevation. You can see the associated frequencies. And at the bottom, we can see a METAR that happens to be available here. If there's an ILS approach at the airport, there'll also be a section that shows the ILS runway, the final approach course, and the localizer frequency. If you click on a VOR, in this case, this is a VORTAC, so it shows me both the VOR frequency 114.3 and the TACAN channel 90 X-ray for use in something like the Super Hornet. All right, that covers all the major features in the NXI version 1.0. If you want to try them out before Sim Update 10 comes out next month, Follow the instructions that are linked in the video description below to opt in to the beta on your PC or Xbox. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.